Um, okay, so I'm going to move this out of the way here. So PhysioU in the online learning environment. So I have been using PhysioU in both a mixed and online learning environment for the last five years. We built these apps to augment the classroom as well as the online learning environment. And in this moment, in the COVID-19 crisis that we find ourselves in, it is even more imperative that we leverage technology, I think, to ensure that the students' learning continues, that they feel supported, and that we have direction. I think the students' anxiety, what I, as I've been speaking to my own students, much of the anxiety comes from this not like, it's almost like you can't, they can't tell what direction they're headed. They're sitting in the same place. They don't, they need to feel like there's a clear direction and there's a way to get through this. Um, and get to their end point of their, their graduation. So uh, just so you know, this webinar is being recorded because a lot of people request it afterwards, um, as well as faculty who aren't able to attend. And I just want to uh, let you know that I've been in the game for 17, probably almost 18 years now uh, at entry level DPT uh, program at Azusa Pacific University. So I'm an associate professor. Um, I'm a teaching and learning fellow, so I've had a chance to learn and think a lot about teaching and learning. It's something that not all of us clinicians were equipped to be. To be. Um, and then I finished my orthopedic residency and manual therapy fellowship at Kaiser Permanente in Southern California um, and, con and continued to teach as faculty with them, as well as for the USC Spine Fellowship. So we use these apps not only at entry level, but at post-professional because these are guideline implementation tools. All the clinical practice guidelines from the Orthopedics uh, Academy of Orthopedics and JOSPT are embedded into these apps in a playable format. And uh, I chair the Institutional Review Board here at the university. Um, and also, I mean, my passion has been thinking about how do we teach this stuff better? How do we use technology to do this better? So what is PhysioU and why did we do it? Well. As all of you know, cost to our students is a big deal. And not only do we weigh cost, but I think we have to weigh benefit of what are the resources we are asking our students to purchase, what we are using, and to make the best choice about how to solve their learning issues and our own teaching issues. So inevitably, I thought, you know what? These kids are carrying phones, computers in their pocket. Why couldn't we create apps that no longer live by the rules of page counts or chapters or sequential nature of reading information. Clinical reasoning is multifaceted. It, it's web. It's, it's, it's a web of clinical reasoning. Apps can do that. We don't live by page counts or sequence. Any moment we think a student needs to think about differential diagnosis, to think about uh, associated impairments related to an orthopedic problem, that button can be there and it can take them to exactly what you want them to see. So there's a lot of power in the way the technology can help bring out the complexity of clinical reasoning. Uh, resources that get shelved, my own little book, soon will get shelved. Uh, I hope to put myself out of business here with my own little book because it just didn't do the job that I needed it to do. Um, um, so I think the idea that the web-based resource is constantly being updated. Like faculty send in to me little requests. Oh, could you change this video or update this test? Or there's a new test that came out. We just go to the green room and we film it and add it into the cloud. It is infinitely changeable and always the, the latest edition. Uh, the resources are not mobile. Are the students carrying your big binder of notes or your online lectures, probably your online lectures they're carrying in their pocket, but their big textbooks, are they, are they bringing that into the clinic with them? No doubt, I still use textbooks in my own classroom. There is a level of depth that I think textbooks are meant to, to bring to our students, a depth of knowledge. And I think the apps can also augment that um, and help that to become an even, even deeper and more clinically relevant learning experience. And because our profession has a lot of motor learning skills uh, involved, I think high quality video in a reliable resource, which is why I want to show you who are the people in these videos, the, soon there will be a day where you will not have to search through YouTube and hope that you can find something that you need. 
Soon, I hope PhysioU will be able to supply all of that for you in a reliable and consistent way. And then, of course, the lack of resources to create context for learning and decision making. So it's really hard. I think the best we've done in textbooks is to create mini cases. But the cases are a bunch of words, maybe a picture or two, and they really end at the question. So I will show you later how we are building simulations to solve this problem because I believe that there's no better place for students to begin to make decisions than in the low stakes environment of the classroom where they can take the information that they've learned and unpack it and make decisions and see patients get better or get worse based on these, these decisions. I think that is, that is deeply needed because it is a void that is very hard to, to fix in entry level but it's also not easy to, um, to grow that and control that learning experience in the clinic. So you see that there are a bunch of allied health experts. And what I mean by allied health experts is uh, PhysioU dreams of bringing allied health experts together. So we are building apps for OT. We're building apps for PT because many of the skills and things that we do, uh, we, they, we benefit from one another. So you'll see that for your splinting class, uh, Dr. David Plushak put together a splinting app to make it so much easier for your students to learn how to splint, right? That's relevant for the OTs and relevant for PTs. We're working on an adaptive equipment uh, app to show how adaptive equipment improves the way people can function. That's relevant to all of us. So I think uh, this is my vision, is, is to create this universal resource with experts. So all of these clinicians who have... Uh, built these apps with us are all clinical experts many of them most of them residency and fellowship trained um, directors of neuro residencies so uh, rest assured the resource is um, I think dependably uh, valid and also infinitely adjustable so the top three objectives for today is really to tell you a little bit about what apps are currently available and how you can actually bring that into your online classroom right away. And to talk a little bit about the three main problems PhysioU can assist with and how to leverage PhysioU into your interactive online classroom. So what you'll see is we started as native apps in Android and iOS in Google, in Google Play and the, the App Store. What we've done is we've consolidated into a web-based platform. We're no longer supporting the iOS and Android world because it's not flexible enough to allow us to add new technology easily. So we are consolidating into a web-based platform. So you'll see all these different apps all consolidated into one button push on your phone or on your computer. You'll see that we've been at this for a while. We started in orthopedics, of course. This is my area of expertise. It was kind of a big problem that I wanted to solve. How do I link examination, range of motion MMT, uh, red flag screening, modalities, TheraX, interventions? How do I link all of that together? Because I know I deliver it in little silos. So we started building and implementing all the clinical practice guidelines. It took us a whole year, probably more than a year, just to figure out, could we put low back pain based on the guidelines in a playable format. And from there, everything began to accelerate. So you can see when we were done with the orthopedic series, we went after range of motion MMT and palpation. We went after all the neuro exams. So every neuro test that you need to teach is videotaped. Is, there's high definition video for you, to, for you and the students to reference. Then there's movement analysis. So we wanted to think about how could we teach movement better? So we made a gate app and then cardiopulmonary, and then special test. Exercise patterns is coming out probably in the next three weeks. Um, teaching assisted devices, gait training, transfers, wheelchair, all of that. Could we do that better by having the students watch a video than trying to read the steps on how to do a modified three-point gait? Uh, PNF right, is coming, coming out probably in the next month as well. And uh, this is something we built with Kaiser Vallejo, uh, some of their instructors and clinicians. And then we have patient education and we have a bunch of other apps. We just re released developmental milestones for my pediatrics instructors. Um, 
uh, medical screening, all filmed and ready to be released, splinting, functional movement analysis. So there's there's a lot of stuff coming down the pipe. Um, I just don't have enough hours in the day. And now I have children, three boys shooting Nerf darts at me while I'm trying to do my work. So, you know, it's a, it, it's a hostile, hostile environment. <laughs> um, now, three main challenges for the online learning environment. First, motor skill development. So I want to just take a quick moment here to say we are struggling just like all of you related to how we're going to run our labs and practical exams. And I'll give you a quick glimpse into how we're doing that at APU and we could just open it up for people to share as well. Um, creating engagement in your online classroom. How do I make what used to be a, a three or four hour face-to-face -face class or a two hour face-to-face -face class engaging? How do I help the students feel like the things they are thinking about matter, that it's actually correct? Or how do I nudge them onto the right track? Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that and things that we've been doing in the online environment. And then talking about how using the apps can help to create a scaffold for deep learning. This is the original dream of the orthopedic apps was that all of this clinical reasoning that was floating around as a cognitive map, something I could tell students about, but I could never show them how things were connected, could now be demonstrated and done repetitively week after week so that their own clinical reasoning pathways could develop, right? Their clinical pattern recognition pathways could, could develop. So from the motor skill development in the online space uh, question that we are all facing, I want you to know that as I was looking through some of the literature, that actually the nursing the nurses have been leaders uh, in, in this. And in this systematic review, they actually talked about how online learning for teaching of clinical skills is no less effective than the traditional means, meaning it can be done. I know it's uncharted territories for some of us from uh, how are we going to teach them the skills? Are we going to just show them videos? Uh, how are they going to actually do it to, to, to someone? So I think we're going to have to figure that out together. But just know that the literature supports that it's okay for us to do this. And also, I would say from the physical therapy literature that some of the apps, some of the er earlier apps, which were actually fabulous, the core apps were fabulous and built by some amazing professors and, and, and colleagues, um, the, the students found that the, e the videos were easily viewed and downloadable to a mobile device and found it highly valuable in learning orthopedic special tests. So it was convenient, it was flexible, it could be used in multiple course activities. So I think there will, you will find that as you delve into these resources, more and more opportunities to create things, to, um, to leverage resources that already exist so that you can use your energy to teach, to create learning experiences. I think this will be very freeing, actually. It, it might just take us to the next evolution of PT education and PTA education. So what, what I want you to see here is this is uh, Dr. Emmanuel, Emmanuel Young's work. This, he's out of uh, Sacred Heart University. So this is one of the simplest ways to leverage PhysioU into your online classroom. So for all of his lab handouts, you can see that what he did is he embedded links. We have created a master cheat sheet with almost every technique that you're going to be teaching. Put your patient in supine, gently lift their head off the table, Use your abdomen to help hold. So that your students can now click and watch the video of the technique for probably 70 to 80%, if not more, of the techniques that we all generally teach. Okay? Now, there's going to be variations. Believe me, I've heard a lot, a lot of conversation about this technique or this test. I think that is where the faculty can, in their face to face time, watch techniques together talk about nuances about how you like to do it and allow the student to then work in that slightly gray area. Granted, I mean, Marshall, who performs all the manual therapy techniques and special tests, is uh, double fellowship trained and is teaches at the residency level, uh, residency level and at entry level. So um, it's going to be pretty close to what you need. 
So what I would say from there is that our students as well as their students have said, hey, it is fantastic to be able to feel like I can look at my techniques ahead of time so that when I go, go online to watch the instructor performing the techniques, it doesn't have to be supine. it doesn't have to be the first and last time. There's a lot of anxiety, uh, even in our surveys that students talk about. The lab is a very anxious time because I can't write everything down. I can't see everything. And it's the first exposure. So just think about what that means for student learning. Watch the labs before you come to class. When we meet online, we're going to observe techniques together. And I'm going to talk you through and, and, and begin to illustrate with my clinical background and my expertise where all of this fits. Right, So you don't have to, at this point, go and try to film everything and organize everything and edit everything. You can rely on PhysioU to provide that resource. So what I want to show you here under PhysioU.com, if I'll show you how to get here later, you'll see that there's a faculty resources page under, under Educator, free faculty resources. And what I'm doing here is essentially going straight to PhysioU under Educator, under Free Resources, we have created this PhysioU Master Cheat Sheet. In the cheat sheet, you will see that we have, a, this is a searchable uh, Google Doc in which every technique for every app that we have created is now searchable and embeddable by you right into your LMS or your lab handout. So that will include neuro exam, every single test that you're going to do, cardio palm, range of motion MMT, all the orthopedic manual therapy, TheraX, special test, transfers and assistive devices, everything is there. And so what I would suggest is that you take those links and you embed them straight into your, in, into your lectures or your lab handouts. Reflection. We put it into our lab handouts. Okay. And the beauty of it is that the students will be able to click on that and it will take them directly to the video. You don't have to organize this in your Google Drive. Everything is sorted out already in the apps. So you can see that for CardioPalm Lab, every single technique, examination and intervention technique is all filmed already. I mean, this is what we use for our lab handout in our CardioPalm class. But later, I will show you that this is not just a repository or a, a, a place for a, a list of techniques. That Many people had done that already and done that very well. You will see that much of the apps, many of these clinical apps, have clinical reasoning pattern development. What are the common conditions? What are the assessment techniques related to that condition? What are the interventions commonly done for those impairments? That logic pathway is really what makes this a powerful tool. It's not just a video library. Um, so here, yep, you can see all of the different lab techniques in the CardioPalm app. Here's the assistive devices app. So our instructors said to us, you know, it's really hard for the students to read our notes and read about how to fit assistive devices or to use them to go up and down stairs. Could we film all of it? so that they could watch it ahead of time, so that they could eventually share these videos with their patients. So what you see then is uh, the assistive devices app has device fitting, gate patterns with all the different assistive devices for both right and left lower extremities. So I'll take you there real quick. So here, here we are inside the app. And James, please make sure you jump in if there's anything I'm missing in the chats. I see little chats coming in here and there. Yeah, I'm trying to do that. And I see if there's anything that's specific that is very timely. I'll have, I'll okay, out. perfect. So you can see the students will know, guys, we're doing assisted device fitting. Before class, I want you to watch these different videos. Okay. And if you have these devices available to you, go ahead and try it out. So, of course, all of these are the different walkers, the instructor is sharing about how to fit this appropriately. You watch it once and it's done. They've learned it. Now you can go in and talk about gate patterns. I want to talk about a modified three-point gate. We're talking about axillary crutches and the left lower extremity. So we put a red stocking on the extremity 
So you have a right lower extremity and a left lower extremity. Why? Because today we are supporting City of Hope Hospital because they need a resource because they are needing to discharge patients to home. They don't have a, a resource yet. We are partnering with them to provide this as a way to enhance their patient care. So they're sending these videos to their patients um, uh, as, as a tool to improve patient care and efficiency for the clinicians. So what we teach the students with will also be what they use in the clinic. That's the value of these types of resources. And you can also see that we've in, included stair training, loft steering crutches, right extremity affected or non-weight bearing, and here are your videos to watch together with a patient, watch with the students, now try it when they can or try it when they get to their boot camp lab come, come summer, which is kind of what we're doing. A lot of the skills that they're not getting right now, we're going to do boot camps when we get back into the classroom. So just, just to close off this app, you can see that bed mobility, videos for bed mobility, videos for sit to stand and stand to sit transfers with the common assistive devices, videos related to transfers. These are generic, so there's probably gonna be nuances how you would like the students to do it, but at least all of this is here now for you to, to utilize. And then finally, wheelchairs, patient education, factors to consider, here's fitting, here is propulsion, one upper extremity, two lower extremities, here's mobility, going up and down curbs, up ramps, through the doors, all of this has been filmed for you. Okay, so something simple like that. I mean, I consider this low hanging fruit. It's just natural to use videos to teach students to, how to do this. All right, so I'm gonna move back here and Oops, let me move back here. The Neuro Exam app is also very similar. It is a perfect reference tool for your neuro class. Our instructor said, hey, I have a binder, a three inch thick binder full of black and white pictures of these neuro tests. Could we film them all? So essentially, the bulk of the tests from Neural Toolbox are here because we thought it would be relevant for the residents relevant for our students, relevant for the clinicians who are out in the clinic. And so here, what you'll see, and I'm just gonna take you there just for a second, in the Neuro Exam app, for example, the way we use it in class is, guys, we're talking about balance this week. So in your lab handout, you have a bunch of techniques that are gonna be linked that I want you to watch ahead of time. So here's your five times sit to stand, uh, Rachel Tabak is now the uh, part of the team at City of Hope uh, for oncology rehab, and she was the director of neuro rehab at Casa Colina in Southern California. And so here she is performing the test. Here is the setup. Here are the cues of what you should say. And here are the normative values uh, for fall risk. So you can see that pretty much everything for neuro, including Diagnosis specific, Fugelmeyer, stream, spinal cord injury, all of Asia, motor and sensory. All of these are videos ready for you to utilize in your classroom, including vestibular, cranial nerve exam, muscle tone, you know, coordination, your neuro exam class, or your, usually that's your neuro rehab one class is covered. Uh, and we are working very hard to release the, the intervention side, that, which will include PNF, of course. Okay, so that is uh, what neuro exams like. So the classes that we have content for in a summary is essentially cardiopalm, that class is completely covered, MSK, completely covered from, from modalities to manual therapy to exercises to movement analysis, um, special testing, all the special, all the common special tests that you are going to teach already organized for you. Uh, your clinical skills class, we have that class going on right now, range of motion, manual muscle test, way easier to learn by watching a video together and then having comments and conversations about it. We added in palpation, 
basic neuro screen here. You have your neuro exam, assistive devices, and then the splint building app is actually a really, really cool app. Uh, when you get a chance, all of you actually have full faculty access. Please go in and play around. And I think the best way to, to add these into your class is a little bit at a time. You just think, uh, I hope that at the end of this, you'll have some seeds of how you might be able to start using it, but really the possibilities are endless. So I want to stop here for a moment. I'm going to share a little bit about what we're doing for virtual labs at APU, and then we could just open it up uh, for a brief discussion because I think this is really a relevant moment to share ideas. So at APU, we have students, students have had access to PhysioU from the first day of class. It is part of the curriculum and it is something that they will use in almost every class. That is the power of this resource. You don't get the textbook when you come to that class. I can reference things related to orthopedics and special tests when they're still in gross anatomy. I can reference things related to range of motion and MMT when they're looking at structures in gross anatomy. So the value of the resource is that it spans the curriculum and it, 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 it breaks, breaks through the boundaries of the silos that we, we as academic instructors tend to live in. So we tell the students, hey, watch the videos before lab. So we're going to do shoulder range of motion or shoulder MMT this week. And then what we were doing before we got barred out of the, the, the um, classroom, out of the university, uh, was we had a, a webcam focused on the instructor and controlled by the, the grad assistant. So you someone has to keep control of the camera because it's really hard to get a good view. I mean, it's, it's bad enough that it, we're streaming it live. It's even worse when the instructor can't tell that his butt's in the way or, or the students really can't see anything because he raised or lowered the table. I mean, think about the frustration that that creates. So there was always someone else to man the camera to make sure that the view was as good as it could be. So we would be live streaming either using Facebook or uh, uh, not Facebook, using Zoom or using, because all of our students have iPads, we use FaceTime as well. The GSA or the grad student was also manning the chat. So there was real time comments and questions. I think that's really important in this environment where the students can have a voice, can ask questions. And I'll tell you, as someone who's running a webinar right now, it's really hard to be in two places at once. That's why it's nice to have the second person. That's why I always invite James to be a part of the, the meeting because one, you have varying viewpoints that you can add into the, into the conversation with the students, but someone can be running, you know, running the, the chat and keeping the students engaged and also allowing them to have a voice into this often one directional feeling online environment. So I think that's really valuable. Then we invite the students to one, visually mental imagery, think about the techniques that they're learning and try wherever they can to use it on someone they're staying with. Um, this is a tricky area. Uh, most programs have agreed to neither discourage or encourage getting together with your classmates because of the social distancing. So I think, I think in our environment as well, we've decided whoever you can try this on, you can try it. Don't worry. We're going to do a lot of these when we get back to boot camp. So they need to know that there's a plan. And then we do do these 15 minute checkoffs. So the skills that they learn for that week they are actually FaceTiming with a, a, a grad student, um, a grad student, and they're demonstrating certain skills. And I'm pleased to, to tell you that most of the grad student assistants have said the students really value the FaceTime checkoffs because there's some interaction and some one-on-one -on -one feedback. So they don't feel like they're just in this virtual space where they're just a number. And surprisingly, the skills that they have been demonstrating are surprisingly good. So this is a good sign. I, I think this is another component that is very important is somehow it would be nice if you could leverage some of your grad assistants, your third years, or if your class is small enough, like in many of the PTA programs, you just have your three adjuncts, including or, or your three faculty members, 
run some short checkoffs that allow the students to touch base, right? I think the students will really value that. So I'm going to in, uh, invite people to just chat in a little bit here um, based on what they're doing. I think we should spend a couple minutes, a few minutes actually just chatting about that. So James, are there any? Yeah, I got a couple questions. That, and just to give your voice a break, you've been going you know, pretty long here. And yep. you do that all the time anyways. But um, one thing, is, and um, the comment was, uh, there are videos in textbooks. One question was, you know, do, does the app replace textbooks? And I think that goes, um, you know, by program, by instructor, instructor. I recognize in, in the conferences that I've attended with you, Michael, in exhibiting that um, there are some that say, you know, I use one book for range of motion, one for muscle testing, because neither book does it right on each one. So they go, this replaced both of those. And it saves the, the students some money in terms of not having to buy two textbooks. Now, I think a lot of instructors may be kind of going through an incremental change, like, well, I don't want to orphan my textbook yet. It's kind of my safe place. And so, and as you get more familiar, I think you might find, uh, um, you know, kind of being able to use the app as your primary resource rather than a textbook. Um, the other thing, they could take it with them in the clinic if they have it on the app instead of lugging around all their notes and their books. And oh, I didn't bring my ortho book with me today, you know, but it's on their app. It's, it's much easier for them to do that. Um, the other question, Michael, was. Um, oh, James, uh, before you go there, let me just say that are these textbook replacements? I would say some of them are, and a lot of them aren't, because I believe the textbooks have a very important place to play in our education. I think as faculty, again, we have to relook at which of the resources that we're asking the students to buy, are we using them well, and are they meeting the learning objectives? If they're not, then one should consider, am I getting the content across between the videos that I have, the content I've created, Am I getting the job done? And if so, then you can be selective about the things that you're asking students to purchase. So for me, I have at least one big textbook that I use to bring the students in deeper related to the different conditions because my apps were not designed to do that. I don't want them reading 20 page swipes on their phone to learn about a pathology. They can learn that somewhere else. But the, what the apps can do in terms of tying together content that they've learned across the span of a year is something unparalleled. No textbook can do that. So I would say, for example, um, learning about gait, learning about range of motion MMT, there are so many, from the perspective of gait, watching videos, looking at images and tables side by side, I think, uh, if I were just to illustrate that real quick, I think that, um, that there, there are certain types of textbooks that you may find I can get the job done without that. And I think that is each instructor has to make that decision for themselves. There, definitely, there are some textbooks that we are eliminating to save students money because we know that we can get the job done. Our, our first time pass rate, having eliminated certain textbooks, is in the, high, in the, in the mid, mid 90s above national and California average. So we know that it can be done and we're not that afraid to do it at this point. Um, go ahead, James. James. Well, the other thing is, um, um, the I think the challenge that you kind of alluded to here is, you know, the, 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 um, the cognitive domain and the effective domains of learning, I mean, that is done quite uh, successfully with the, the um, you know, the distance learning thing. The psychomotor stuff and, 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 and uh, James Baldwin and Steve McDavid said they have a mechanism by which they videotape their students. And so I think that's a challenge. The students videotape themselves and then upload their sense to their teacher. That's awesome. That's a challenge. And I think that's where it's being figured out now. And you just offered the way you do it at APU. And we'll follow up with looking at this bongo. So thank you to uh, Jane and to Steve. And yes. That. And yeah, that's the, we're, the we're crew. All, we're all moving this together. Yeah. Right. I mean, the crew from South College and a lot of these hybrid programs that have been running this way, I think have a lot of things to share. I mean, um, and I do think that keeping the students accountable, even if it is filming themselves trying to do the technique, is a step in the right direction. It is something for them to do that moves them further along the spectrum of learning the motor skill or, or eventually perfecting at least to entry-level standards the motor skill. I think that's a really valuable component. I mean, it's, it's asynchronous. They do it on their own time. You can watch it at double speed. 
So in, in some ways, it can be a very efficient way. I think that should be part of the mechanism probably in the long run. So yeah, the, shout out the, to Steve and the, the South College group. Is, um, they're asking, has it been translated to say Spanish? And I know you've done it in Chinese, but you can tell the genesis of that. And yeah. Created COVID. You even did that before COVID. So I mean, it's kind of interesting to tell that story real quick. Yeah, I would just say that some of the, re the fellows that I had tr been training in uh, Shanghai and Beijing, who are professors now, they wrote, reached out to us in the early days, the first few days, uh, the first few weeks of the Wuhan virus and said, you know what, we have all been shut down and we're shut down indefinitely. Please, can we get the translation mechanism ready for at least the orthopedic apps? And so together with their professors and stuff that we had been doing over the last three years, we have all the orthopedic apps translated into Mandarin. Now, the future, where where all of the revenue that comes into PhysioU goes is to continue to create new tools, new simulations and translation mechanisms. So yes, the, the new back end that we're building will have automatic translation mechanisms built in after which uh, ally faculty from many different countries and, and, and those of us who are here who are bilingual will then be able to step in and actually actually modify the content and you know because auto translates will always be terrible you should see like my auto corrects on my on my chats on my tweets so there will be a automatic uh translation mechanism that will then be uh human by human eyes and human mind corrected to make it really relevant so that that's in process it's very time consuming and very expensive. I mean, we're, we're very sensitive also to the need for closed captioning and for accessibility um, and those, those demands. So our new back end, we are really trying to focus on, on that. Maybe on the chat, uh, people can say, you know, what languages they would favor first uh, if there's being a focus on visual you to change. Yeah, you know, really you know I would say first, that. Um, uh, um, you know, Tagali, Nance, whatever. I mean, what would be the next languages? Yeah. I would just say that we, we have that pretty pretty well sorted out. We have all of Japan waiting. We have professor friends in Japan. So Japanese, Spanish, um, uh, Japanese, Spanish, uh, Chinese, and then from there, I hope that we can go after other, uh, other languages as well. Any other comments? I heard someone. Joanne, were you going to say something? Or any other comments? Okay, so I'm going to move on here. Um, give me one second. Let me see. Okay, so what you see here is the gate app. So in the gate app, actually, give me one second, everybody. I'm going to try to mute. Okay, perfect. So in the gate app, what you can see... Actually, for those of you who are online, um, I think it might be Joanne. If you don't mind muting yourself, um, some of the noise is coming through, coming through here. All right. So thank you. So um, you can see that we thought teaching people about human movement should not be done with just static images. So we took movement. We took uh, people into the mo motion capture lab and captured real-time range of motion, real-time EMG. We got patients for all the gate deviations. You don't have to search anymore. All of that is here in the gate app, right? And we're gonna use this platform to then develop a functional movement analysis app, utilizing the same idea of phases and uh, movement deviations um, and looking at different joints and what moves first. If you think about forward bend, return from bend, sit to stand. So we are working on that. We're, we're actually submitting a presentation to talk a little bit about it at CSM uh, for next year. Okay, so you can see here, this is uh, Tyler, Tyler Schultz. Tyler, Tyler helped with putting together case studies and organizing the prosthetic gate side of our gate app. So I'm just going to let him say a couple words My here. My name is Tyler Schultz. I'm an assistant professor at Wingate University, and I was involved in developing the prosthetic gate modules on PhysioU. Um, and I just want to talk briefly about how I've used those in the classroom. Um, one of the main ways that I've used this in the classroom is 
um, to have students pre-study before they come in and learn gait deviations for a prosthetic user. What we've found in the past is videos have been helpful for this, but a lot of the videos hadn't really been updated since the late 80s or early 90s. So they didn't lend themselves well to a more HD environment or a more interactive environment that our students are used to. So we filmed the, the videos um, here for PhysioU under analyzed deviations and then prosthetics. So in the classroom, I have the students go through and review these on their own prior to class. So tr both transtibial and transfemoral. And really what I want them to do is just get exposed and get accustomed to what are they looking at, how are looking at it from the, you know, both the left, right, and then also from the uh, anterior, posterior views. And I'm less concerned that they memorize all this information as opposed to just starting to see the information on their screen, on their phone, or on their computer. Then when we come into class, I can go back through and discuss these points in a little bit more detail. And then we can also go through in the gate app and go into our case studies and apply these case studies um, in more of a clinical reasoning type scenario. So we can take our 28 year old male with instability. We can look at a, We can watch a video of him ambulating from all those same views that we've already seen. Now these are, these are the same videos that the students have already pre-studied from, but they're blinded as to which, uh, which video it is. So they have to go back and actually reanalyze this individual's gait. And then from that, they get a little bit uh, additional information in terms of amputation level, um, occupation, complaints, past medical history, and so on. And then we can go through this. Um, I usually do one or two in the class just to give them an idea of how to use the interface and what types of things we're looking for from a clinical reasoning perspective. And then I'll break them into groups and have them go through the rest of the case studies on their own. Um, and then we come back as a big group and go over the clinical reasoning for each case. So this uh, allows us to hit those major clinical reasoning points um, for each of these cases and apply those gate deviations that they have pre-studied for and that we've talked as a, as a class. And now we're going through application and clinical reasoning. My name is Tyler. So... In that sense, we have tried to build in lots of interactive case studies. I'll show you an even uh, a, a, another glimpse of it and how I used it last week. I think it was last week um, uh, for another university where we were talking about multiple systems, looking at orthopedic and cardiopulmonary considerations related to a patient. Um, we In your online classroom as well, we just released developmental milestones. So we've tried to follow this baby for every month of the first 12 months of his life. Uh, of course, he came to us at month one, so we have a, 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 a month zero infant here. But you'll be able to watch him as he changes in the way that he moves. Talk about the observations that you would make at this, at this month. Look at what a typical development may be. And then jump from month to month and watch how this baby changes, how he sits different. You also have all of these reflexes that you have. I mean, part of this is um, um, putting all the resources and making it easy for the students to access on their own time as well as for the faculty to pull up at any time. So imagine you're in your Zoom meeting. You just log into PhysioU and you start referencing these videos, of which many of you do have your own set of videos, but now these videos are available to the students to look at again and again, right? So it, I think of it as graded exposure. When they can watch this ahead of time and think about it again in class and watch it anytime they want when they're out of class, it is a very, very different way to soak, give them a deep soak into their, into their mind. This is something that we'll be releasing very soon. This is some work by Edie Kendall, uh, Dr. Edie Kendall out of uh, Plymouth University as well as uh, Brian Cleveley, Dr. Brian Cleveley out of University of Idaho. So we've partnered with them uh, to create a pediatric gait analysis. So our, we've been beta testing it in our own class at APU uh, and ironing out some of the kinks. These, uh, some of these virtual reality children are real children. Um, and essentially, we are asking the students to do an Edinburgh visual gait analysis gait score. 
so that the students will be able to have the, the, the child walk. They will be able to rotate around the child and view the different uh, front, side, rear view. They'll be able to apply a goniometer and go through the systematic approach of a visual movement analysis. And at the end of it, their score will be matched against the key in which they can then compare their findings with their colleagues. Uh, another just new way at looking at how to create systematic movement analysis. So this is something that we just test, uh, we beta tested it last week and we are continuing to refine it over the next few weeks. So I just talked to uh, Brian this, I think it was yesterday, and we have a list of little things that we want to update before we release it officially. Okay. So here is the cardiopulmonary multiple systems cases. So what I uh, want to show you, so if you click into the CardioPulm app, we used this last week as we did an online discussion and breakout rooms. So I'll show you that. What you see here is the patient. Well, I have been fairly active all my life, but lately I have been so tired and so weak. So you have these cases that you can watch together. Or, you know, uh, here are a number of different cases that you can watch together. So the students will go out into their breakout rooms. All of you are going to break out into groups of five. And you're going to read the case together. Because after the case, we have some clinical reasoning questions that we're going to go through. Some of these clinical reasoning questions will be like, Hey, on auscultation, you hear the sound. So based on what you hear, right, identify the sound and what the cause may be. Or you may have another case where the person is saying, where you're actually looking at not just the, uh, just the heart sounds, but also per potentially the, uh, let me see, I think it's this case here, where you're looking at the ECG. So you're, the next day you visit the patient for their therapy session and you note the ECG. So based on what you found, what you see here, what is your interpretation and the appropriate course of action related to exercise? So there's the ability for you to take them a little bit deeper and have interactive conversations, allow them to talk about it in their groups, bring them back together out of their breakout rooms, and then have a larger discussion. And then, of course, we tried our best to hide the answers, and, even, and then, of course, bring up the answers when you need them. So this is one way to utilize the apps. So the, the GATE app, the cardiopulmonary app has some really nice case studies that you can already utilize. For the orthopedic side of the apps, we are building simulations that I'll show you in a second. So let me move on from here. The last main topic that I want to share with you, and that will kind of take us into the simulations that we're building, um, is seeing the big picture. So you know that many of the courses that we teach are built into little silos, right? Nine weeks or 16 weeks at a time. And the challenge always is your student, I mean, I mean, I hope this is not just unique to our students, but the CIs are saying your students don't know how to choose therapeutic exercises. They don't know why are they doing so many special tests. They don't know how to match impairments to the objective or to the interventions, right? All of this, I think, is the symptoms of the silo, the silo nature of how we deliver information. So when you think about, I'm going to share with you a little glimpse of how I use the orthopedic app. In class, I always do online discussion, and I always invite them into the conversation at the beginning. So if I'm talking about the shoulder joint, I will ask students to type in or sh share verbally, what are some of the common conditions we're going to be talking about today? And let them speak. Let them share how their mom looked when they had frozen shoulder, right? And so you are essentially accessing in the mind of the individual student, giving them a safe place to share their experiences and validating what they know. Because if you can validate what they know, you can build on it that much more and 
when you say, man, Jim, that was right. That is exactly how frozen shoulder progresses through the stages. She was really painful at the beginning and eventually the pain got better, but the stiffness got a lot worse, right? That is exactly how we manage these different types of these frozen shoulder type patients. When students feel that what they know is valuable, they kind of dig in a little. They're like more engaged. So I think that's a very important thing to consider as you open up your your online classroom is, is there a way for me to bring them in before I start hosing them with no, nonstop knowledge, right? Turning on, turning on the fire hydrant. I also use the app to play through two or three patterns weekly. So one of the things I would I would invite you to consider is a resource, much like a textbook, is only as good as the faculty teaches the student how to use and gives them a call to action to use, right? So think about it. A textbook has many chapters and a lot of words. Students really don't want to go there unless the teacher says, you must read this because it will make you smarter and not, let me show you how. I found that with our apps, it's the same thing. So not only that, it would be nice for them to use some type of guided worksheet to help them kind of flow through the information and also to discuss red flags even if they haven't gotten the red flags class yet, when you're talking about the context of a condition, let's say in the upper quarter or in the low back, it's nice to kind of tease them with some ideas about some red flags that they're going to learn about, some things to watch out for, because I again, I think of this as graded exposure. So let's play. I'm going to take you into the app and show you that every week I do this in ortho. So I go into the clinical pattern recognition uh, ortho app and I choose a condition. Let's say we're in shoulder week. Many times I will play with them using pain patterns because that kind of puts them into detective mode. So what kind of condition guys do you think based on what you just told me about the conditions we're going to talk about what are your hypothetical conditions that this pain pattern might bring up? So if you click on that They'll, you'll, many of them will say, oh yeah, AC joint sprain or uh, shoulder impingement, subacromial pain syndrome. Perfect. Exactly. It could be any number of conditions and we should go and explore more about the signs and symptoms that help us to tease out one from another. At that point, I also bring up some red flags. I don't go too deep into it. We're going to go deeper later. But I want to put into their mind that there are some red flag conditions that we may want to be aware of and give them a little glimpse of some things that might increase the likelihood that the red flag is present, some examination findings that they might not know too much about but they're going to see again in another class. So I kind of tease that into them and say, guys, anytime we're looking at a patient, we're always wondering that first question, is this patient PT appropriate? And this is how you do it. Lots of times it's regional, it's based on the signs and symptoms, and it, you, you essentially can raise and lower your suspicion because you kind of know what are some of the common red flags that you're, you're looking for. This is how we're writing the new red flags clinical practice guidelines for the uh, Academy of Orthopedics. It will be by region and also tied to these, you know, systematic review or guideline based recommendations related to some of these common red flag conditions. Uh, it's something we presented the last two years at CSM. So if we go on beyond the red flags, you can see that I will watch. Okay, you can look at prevalence data. All of that is linked to their PubMed abstracts. You can watch a video of how this patient pa might present in the clinic. Half tendinopathy. The patient will often complain of subacromial pinching pain, a sharp pain in the subacromial region, an arc of pain, but full range of motion, so in some ways, I use this as a way to bring the patient. So this isn't just words. The patient here demonstrates a, an arc of pain and a pinching pain in the subacromial space. I'll ask them, what do you see about the way the guy's lifting his arms? Any problems with that? Are there contributions that impairments that you think we should begin to investigate based on what you're seeing? Oh, I wonder if the medial rotators of his humerus are really short. I wonder if he's really kyphotic. So all of these conversations allow you to kind of share your clinical expertise and paint a picture of the clinical pattern that they're commonly going to see in the clinic. Then I'll ask the students, hey, so based on your previous experiences, 
what do you think we're going to do to examine the patient? So they will share a bunch of different things. They'll type a few things in. I'll say, yeah, exactly. We're the movement specialist. So we are going to assess their physiologic range. Here are all the videos of things that you've learned in your clinical skills class, things that we're going to do in class together, your hand behind back with overpressures. And here's some of your accessory mobility that we're going to learn in lab together. So I'm going to expose them to it. I don't need them to watch the videos. Some of the techniques I will actually purposely watch. Many of it I will just tease them in and allow them to explore later. But what I'm doing is I'm telling a story and I'm illustrating it with the app so that they are not afraid to go in and learn on their own. This is the power of creating these asynchronous uh, learning environments as well as teaching them how to learn on their own. So some of them will talk about impingement tests. I'll say, yeah, exactly. You're going to learn about a couple of key impingement tests and they are commonly tied to a cluster of tests. So you can see your research numbers, the test item cluster. All of this becomes part of the, the thread, the scaffold that they're going to use to make sense of the lab. I purposely do this on the first day of class because they would have seen 80% of the techniques I'm gonna show them in lab. They would have seen and already created a scaffold, a context, in which to assign those techniques meaning. Imagine how much easier it will be for them to figure out when to use what. And then of course, in the app, you can see, you can use the, thumb, the, the breadcrumbs up here that we talk about movement faults, right? We shouldn't be talking about pathology and conditions without considering what movements may contribute to this problem. So here are a number of different movement faults, posterior, insufficient posterior tipping, excessive winging, insufficient upward rotation and elevation, how to examine it, right? Posture observation, a scapular assistance test, some type of muscle testing in relevant muscles that might control the motion. And there's also conversations about differential diagnosis. I may not have taught them anything about the cervical spine yet, but I'm going to put I'm going to grade, gradedly expose them to some ideas that are consistent, right? When we look at quick screens, we often overpress joints and do some type of accessory mobility to prove that it's not the joint that's involved. There's also these little clinical reasoning videos that our students will watch. These are just two or three, one or two minute videos that contextualize these collection of, of, of content below. So our students will watch that as well. And so differential diagnosis, associated impairments, thoracic mobility stiffness, upper quarter muscle length, upper quarter muscle strength, really it's the Yanda's upper cross syndrome, scapulothoracic mobility, some key overhead athlete specific impairments. Um, Amy Seitz said, hey, you know what? With a lot of the overhead athletes, there's some specific impairments that we sh if we could, we could add it in so that students would be able to think bigger um, uh, expand their thinking. So we added that in. Um, and then all of this is then linked to the interventions. Here's the clinical reasoning video for the overarching principles of management. And then here are some of the common interventions. Mobilizations with movement, mobbing posterior capsule or inferior capsule if it's indicated, right? Improving soft tissue mobility. If you found that the pecs pecs or lats were tight, here is the soft tissue and stretch. So we're trying to link the exam to the intervention, uh, manual therapy intervention to the therapeutic exercise, right? The matching therapeutic exercise interventions. And that will eventually lead to uh, patient education. So all of our students will learn to read the patient education because we are going to expect them in their mock evals to tell the patient, here's what's going on, here's how long it will take, this is what we're gonna do in therapy, and here's something you can do to help yourself. And wherever it's indicated, so for example, if we went to a condition like frozen shoulder, so here's how you get to all the conditions quickly. So in frozen shoulder, you can see in the interventions that the guidelines indicates that certain modalities are relevant. And so this is how I build a bridge back to the modalities class. And I'll say, doesn't that, there's, 
there's weak evidence from the guidelines that says this is something you could try with your frozen shoulder patient or TENS, right? And here's the cues, the setup. So you can see how many different ways I'm trying to access and revalidate the things that they've learned. Okay, so let me close this off here. I know we're coming towards the end of our time. There is a clinical pattern recognition reflection worksheet. It's kind of a guided worksheet that allows students to explore patterns and pull out information from the app. And all of these are hyperlinked. So it's the hyperlink is to an example condition, but the students will soon learn that every time Dr. Wong wants me to go to a new joint, I need to explore the common conditions and begin to set up my scaffold. This worksheet is available on free resources at our physiou.com educator web, uh, web page. You guys can download that and play with that or modify it. You'll see that it walks them through the entire examination, kind of gets them to think about the signs and symptoms and what's unique to this condition, uh, think about the common impairments and movement faults that may con contribute to the condition. All of that is built into this worksheet. And what you can see here in this online discussion that we did a couple weeks ago was I had a hypothetical conversation looking at a patient presentation with the students. And so we talked about hypotheses, hypotheses that they actually typed in. We talked through what this patient might look like, how he might move. We then went into a case study and all of them broke up into their little breakout rooms and I would just hop in and guide them through their clinical reasoning form. And eventually as they designed their objective exam, they went through the app to look for tests that they were gonna do or impairments that they were gonna, they were going to examine. We then broke, came back together in the large group and talked through the case together. So that's one way that we're using the apps in the online space. So um, I just wanted to share with you some data that we presented here at ELC in 2018 about how the students were responding to the use of these apps. The first question we asked them was, are you buying the textbooks that we're asking you to buy? And 80% of our students said, we're buying less than 40% of the textbooks you are requiring or recommending because we don't see the value. And I think that the onus is on us to really if we're asking them to use a textbook, to really make sure we guide them in how to use it and how to learn from it so that they really begin to become invested in that tool. It's the same way with these apps. That's why I use it every week with them. We also found when we asked them, how did the apps help you? They talked about how mastery and confidence was a big deal for them. I was able to learn these techniques better because I could see them over and over again. It helped me to prepare for the clinic. It helped me to synthesize in learning because I could see all the dots connected. I, there were cases where I could interact with to make decisions. And it helped me develop my clinical reasoning as well. I think this is very telling. It reduced anxiety in lab. And I know for those of you, sorry, for those of you who have to leave early or have to leave, I'm sorry, I've run a little over time. Um, um, but this will be recorded and we'll send it out to, to everybody. Uh, it's more efficient and it really helped them develop as student clinicians. So in closing, I just want to share with you that the future of what we are building is to begin to solve some of these issues. And if you all remember these uh, choose your own adventure books, I think there's something to it. Think about how engaging that was for you. In, in, in reading. Now, this is a challenge for PTA, PT and PTA students alike, screening for red flags, making appropriate referral decisions, progressing and regressing interventions. So what we have been doing, we have about 50 cases that we're almost ready to release, where students will go, the, these first 50 are related to orthopedics. So every body region will have three to four cases where they will go back on the weekends and read through, the case, read through the case, look at the different tests and objective exam that was done, look at outcome measures and make decisions about 
what the outcome measure meant. To look at the objective exam and determine what type of treatments, what dosage, what modality would be relevant. And when the patients, when they made the right decision, the patient would get better. When they made the wrong decision, the patients would get worse. We have built about 50 of these. And you can imagine how much time it takes to create these web, you know, these, these choose your own adventure type games. What I want to show you is what we built yesterday. Everybody has been calling, talking to me about how in the world are we going to talk and teach modalities. So imagine that along with your online lectures, the students will be able to now go through and refresh the steps of how to use an ultrasound machine. And then we'll move on into looking at the different parts because I want them to be able to hover over the different components and learn about the gel. I will intersperse questions related to the gel that I want them to answer. They can now click over the different buttons and begin to see how they can set up the parameters. So there's different buttons related to time, related to intensity, related to frequency and duty cycle. This is how I'm envisioning solving that problem. There is somewhat of an interactive motor skill kind of pseudo environment that will bring the modality into the virtual classroom. So then here are some questions. I want you to put in order of what you should do first. So I'm gonna put gel on the skin first. I'm gonna put place the transducer on the skin and eventually they choose all the right answers and they can move on. So here is some information about the ultrasound head because they clicked over the ultrasound head. And then there's a video of a quick video of me performing the technique. So we have probably 60 to 70% of the modalities. We are feverishly editing and trying to get this released because we know what the need is for, for all of you in the classroom. So they can watch that. I, I, I don't have time to show you how the app will be, but this is how the simulations will be. And at the very end of this, there will be a little game. And the game will allow the students to then play through a case, rule out contraindications and precautions, make decisions about pulsed or continuous ultrasound, about dosage, and then allow them to then succeed applying the modality. So um, that is, I, I, would, I would also want to, to kind of give you a glimpse of something that James and I have been, put, been putting together, and this related to your laws and regs, your ethics class. We decided that it was really hard to, to really teach this stuff just from the black and white pages. So James, if you want to just take a moment to share what you've been doing. Yeah, um, and I'm going to do this in less than 60 seconds because I know we're over a lot now. But, um, you know, the goal of these of our programs is to you know, make competent and efficacious uh, clinicians, but they can't do that if they don't pass the exams to get their license. And the second exam in 29 uh, jurisdictions is a, is a jurisprudence or laws and regs thing. And just roughly about 20% of the students are not passing that. So there's a delay in them getting their license, their ability to earn an income, to start paying off their student loans. So... So we're putting together um, the apps for, um, and, and here's Mike's clicking, in fact, I'm clicking through some of the examples we have. We got California done. Texas is got about 160 pages long as compared to Arkansas, which is 13 pages long. So I don't know why I did Texas next because it's taking, it's like taking a climb at a 10 foot or 10,000 foot peak a, a yard at a time going through their stuff. Anyhow, so we're going to get this done for you guys. That way it'll help you. It's kind of the, you know, watching paint dry and sausage being made, you know, type thing that most programs are always struggling to find someone to teach this. And so we're going to get this going for you guys. Yeah, and I nice. would just say that what we did was for all the key areas of the, of the jurisprudence exam, we basically created scenarios so that your students could learn the law to become a legal and ethical therapist based on the common scenarios they're going to see in the clinic. So the scenarios drive the context in which these questions 
Is it lawful for Tyler, the PTLA, to follow the director's instructions to continue to treat even though the lead therapist is still on a plane, on a delayed plane? When they choose the right answer, they are awarded by correct and why, and also it is linked to the laws and regs that they can read. There's no better way for them to learn this, and there's no better way for them to be engaged in the classroom as well as preparing for their jurisprudence exam for any of the states that will have this exam. We are done with California. Jim is on Texas now. We will have all the states done, and this will be an adjunct, can be an adjunct into your classroom. Yeah. And so for the students, and this is also the, the practicing uh, therapists who, um, who change jurisdictions, uh, they'll get their uh, the clinical side, they get kind of waived or rest, reciprocity, but uh, most often they have to still take the jurisprudence. So this is also good for you guys if you ever change your location where you're teaching. And also compact, um, about 13 of the compact states require, no more than that, of uh, compact states require the passing of the jurisprudence. So um, so it's not just for entry-level education, it's for also clinical application. Yep. Um, Mike, are we getting done? Because I got about three or four bullet questions I want to yep, have you. We are pretty about. much done here. I would just say that, that we are collaborating with many universities. I'm very eager to be in touch with you if you have ideas of things that need to be built. Um, many universities are beta testing this. The cost to students, we are very aware of the burden. It is $54 per year. It's usually $99 a year, but for students, it's $54 a year paid annually. So it's $4.50 a month. It's cheaper than a, a, a mocha from, from a Starbucks. Uh, the students have access for four years if they buy three years, the, the whole PT package. But all faculty have free access. Now, because we are in this moment where everything has been shifted online, I want you to know that PhysioU has, is providing free access to all students and all faculty in the world um, because we don't want this moment to be a barrier to their learning. So we are, we are excited to partner with you and to provide this. You don't have to worry, well, if I'm going to embed videos, can my students access this? Well, they do need to log in, but they're all going to have access for free. And this is free until June 1st, and at that time we'll reconsider. Um, but I think you will get a chance to really test this out and see how the students respond. We wanted to remove any barriers that we could to make sure that students could keep learning. In fact, we, would, we could relieve some of the stress on the faculty as well. So um, I think that's... I would just close out with that idea that in order to do this, faculty only need to go to physiou.com coronavirus slash coronavirus and sign up for your students. We need to know how many students you need us to send codes for. And then we will send you a list of 70 codes that you can distribute to your students. The challenge is that sometimes students will take a code, they think that they've validated it and they, they, they don't check and log in and they'll grab three other codes because they thought they didn't log in. So um, just be careful as you, as you share the codes, but the fastest way to get access for your students is to go here and sign up. There is a link uh, for faculty to sign up and then we will process it and send codes to you. If you have faculty that you want unlocked, don't give them any of these codes. These codes are for students only and they do eventually expire. I will tell you that the subscription, the minimal subscription that they are paying, they will eventually pay, helps us to build more and more tools to support their learning. And so we very much appreciate your support. And as you can see, we are responsive. We are making things in the moment to try to make it easier for faculty and students to teach and learn. So I would just uh, open it up actually uh, for questions. I know that we're past time. Um, but James, did you have any comments or questions? Well, the um, faculty access, that first time you had the faculty, um, that one assistance part, you did it pretty early in the first third of your talk. Uh, yes. Can you remind them where to find that? Oh, yeah. So um, there's, resources. Yeah. there's two places. One, if you go to physiou.com and you go under educator, there's free resources for the educator. So you've got like this clinical pattern recognition worksheet. You've got this Physio U Master Cheat Sheet with all the video links. And you can see down here all the different apps. Every single video is linked here. Okay, so that's one thing. 
for you to sign up for your students, if you go to physiou.com slash coronavirus, you will see that there is a form here. Apply here for your virtual classroom access. And we just need to know how many students do you need it for. And we're happy to give it to every cohort, right? If they are going to be, it doesn't matter which class they're in because we probably have an app that might be useful for that. Do, um, do, uh, do you have modality done besides the one you have in the, in the pipeline? Uh, modalities is not done. We are, we're expediting it and it's, it's going to be really cool. I mean, okay. um, yeah. Wound it's, care, where's wound care found? We're working on wound care. Wound care, I think, will end up being a game. It's going to be a simulation. Okay. Yep. But, I, okay. yeah, go ahead. Keep, go, keep going with the questions. I'm just giving oh. a glimpse of what the modalities app is going to look like. Yeah, while you're doing that, you know, I think that um, the question in terms of, um, you know, the PTA applicability of this, I think is just as important as it is for the PT. And, and I think that the, the PT assistant spending time on this app is so valuable. Red flags are red flags, whether PT or PTA. I mean, if, if, a, if a physical therapist tells the, the, the PTA to do some cervical work, but they didn't see that they cleared the ALR or transverse cruciate ligaments, you know, PTA should, should, should speak up. It's like my sister who's a nurse who recognized the contraindication of medication the physician ordered when she was working in ICU. She just called their attention to say, hey, you know, don't know if you know this, but these things kind of, we're not going to have a good outcome if we do this. And it's not second guessing them, but it's, that's where the PTA, I think it's valuable for them to see the special tests we do just so that way they know that, hey, did they do those so I can be really good. The other thing is um, how much can the PTA do um, in terms of uh, uh, independence, in terms of progression, treatment plans, stuff like that. I think that's jurisdictionally uh, uh, specific. In California, for example, um, a PTA uh, works under or with a physical therapist. Physical therapist is always the therapist of record. And so anything that PTA does, the PT is still responsible for it too. So, so depending on the agreement or the understanding between the PT and PTA, there will be a level of advancement that the PTA might be able to do as long as it stays within the treatment plan that the physical therapist wrote. So, so that's kind of a, a jurisdiction by jurisdiction question in terms of what's going on there. I can have one yeah. PTA, I let them do joint mold. There's some that I can say, hey, the best you can do is do exercise stuff because I don't know your skill set. Not that you don't know, but I just don't know as a therapist whether I can allow that competency to occur. So it's just teamwork is really yeah. where to go. And, and related to the conversation about the PTA, I think what is really powerful about sometimes playing through how I pay, play through the orthopedic app is it allows the PTA to see the big picture. And it is kind of our job to pull the, P, the rehab team together and to allow that context to inform the reason why we are doing these interventions for strengthening is because there was weakness found. And that relates to this type of clinical pattern. And for this person, we are doing modalities that enhance joint mobility. We're using heat and continuous ultrasound. And we're using MOBs and, and exercises that enhance that frozen shoulder person's mobility. Because when you look through the app, you saw that the patient presented with mobility loss. You saw that the examination was tied to impairments of mobility. And that thus, the interventions were all tied. Those kind of big pictures, I think, will make the rehab team and the PTA and PT relationship that much tighter. And in the end, it's the patient that wins. So, any other questions, James? Um, Dave, you had a question. Uh, Pesner, you had a question about negotiating. Oh, hi, Dave. Yeah. yeah. Dave, did you want to unmute yourself and ask the question, or? I think you just answered it. Um, I was typing here that we've got four, this is our fourth cohort, I think, now in our program. Yep. That you've made this available to us. Um, and uh, my biggest problem is that you add content faster than my faculty can keep up. <laughs> so it related to... Um, and so right now we're uh, we're doing MSK. My, I'm I'm, get, I'm fielding questions from my MSK instructor who's in her Zoom class right now. <laughs> uh, but um, no, we have it. Uh, we have uh, uh, some newbies in their first semester, and then we have folks in their fourth semester. And the the biggest problem that we have at the PTA level is um, finding content that will help us. Uh, make that transition from a very transactional leadership style at the beginning 
show me this, do this, to at the end, this transformational style where you're, you've uh, either through games, which I think is going to be really great, or through these other tools that you have has helped really helped us bridge that sort of thinking gap, knowledge gap. But um, I was, you just showed it. I was trying to follow uh, because that is a frustration. You remember you saw something, it's maybe embedded in the app someplace where it didn't come up for you right away because you're in a different class, but you know you want to do this. And then finding it's been a little bit tricky. And yeah. Then, um, a search uh, function. Uh, we are in, we are probably about, um, we are about, we have a search function in the beta side of the app that you guys don't see where we test all the, all the new things. And the search function will be really cool. So it will show up. It is designed to show up here. So no matter where you are in whatever app, whether you're on your phone or you're, or you're you know, with a tiny screen or an iPad or a computer, you will have a couple of places to type in a search. So you could say Apley's test or Lockman's test, and it will immediately go and find the test for you in you know, our 5,000 videos. So recognize- That would be super I, helpful. Yeah, that's coming. Especially when we're on the fly, we're in class and we're trying to grab something quickly. Exactly. That would be super, super helpful. I mean, I'll appreciate that. It, Dave, it brings up a good point. I almost never go, I mean, I've done this enough that I know exactly where everything is but you never go into the classroom to use this without having run it through once yourself. That's really valuable because then you can wield it like your, it's your pro tool. And then it gives the students confidence because it, it doesn't help their clarity when you're wandering around trying to figure things out on the fly. But when you're like, this is what I want you to learn from it. These are the examination techniques that you're gonna learn in class. When they can see that orderliness, it really translates into their ability to utilize the tool themselves. Well, I would say to that end that one of the other issues that we have is simply training. Uh, as I get a new lab instructor, um, you know, just showing them all the different power of this is difficult. So I think as you ramp up those uh, uh, user training uh, resources, that'll be really helpful for us. Got it. In terms of training folks. Will do. Thank you, Dave. Other questions, James? Well, I think uh, the comment just, and Dave, you mentioned that, and I'm just ready to type it, it's easier to say it, but the, any, I think anyone's first look at this is that oh, it's overwhelming, and the, all the resources on this Visual U app, and it's, you know, kind of taking chunks or in bites and pieces, and maybe if you're the ortho person, you know, but you're the program director, but you still do ortho, you obviously spend time in the ortho and get to know that very well, if it's, and then you can help, um, um, the other faculty kind of do it, uh, get familiar with the Visual U apps and all the resources available to it. Um, it's like um, like getting a drink out of a fire hydrant at first here. So uh, be patient. And that's where I think between now and June, faculty and students, you know, boy, spend time on it, uh, play with it, explore it, and, and you'll see all the things there. There are some logistical questions that maybe uh, Dr. Wong can answer offline in terms of can you embed videos into different learning uh, platforms, uh, Canvas versus Moodle or... Or well, the or best the best way to do that is really you can see all the faculty here logging in and digging around and using these. So the, what I would say is the fastest and easiest way for faculty to do that is not to grab the video itself because that eventually becomes massive. It's really to grab the links. So now you can just grab a link and put it at every technique. You could grab a link and embed it in your lab handout. In your LMS, you could grab the link and embed it into your LMS. So I think that's the fastest way for you guys to uh, really utilize the thousands of videos that we have. You know, and I think, Mike, you're, uh, I'm very fortunate to know Michael from the beginning uh, as he became a therapist stuff, but but that this is continuing on going and, 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 and Jane and, and Steve, you guys wrote where you're able to videotape the students and then grade their psychomotor kind of aspect and that's great that we do that the last comment i have here i wonder it'd be interesting you know i taught a program where there's pta program ot speech uh medical nursing everything like that it'd be neat eventually and this is like um, dr wong to yell at me finish your laws and regs thing first before you start thinking about other things to do but imagine a pt pta program kind of working in concert with each other through the visual you app to kind of see the interprofessional um relationship between the two 
uh, with that. And then maybe even grow to us with OT and us with speech and all that stuff. But that's, that's the 10,000 foot, me being a visionary and futurist, look at what we can go with all the stuff we're doing. So thank you, Michael. Yes, absolutely. Are there, are there, is, are there any more comments then, James? Um, maybe some, I try to get most of the modalities, wound care, the faculty access. Yeah. Let me just speak um, briefly about the wound care. I have been working with, uh, Shelly Swen, uh, about how do we create a wound care app? I don't think it's the information delivery. That's the problem there. I think most wound care classes actually deliver the information pretty well. I think it's the context in which the students learn to use the information. That's, that's what's missing. Um, and so we see it on our own board pass scores as well. Wound care integumentary is always low. And so we decided that the best way to do this is to build the game. So imagine with me that one day the patient is going, instead of a patient, you're going to read a story and see a wound. And that wound is going to have a bunch of descriptors and it's going to ask you to make decisions about, do you want to moisten that wound? Do you need to dry it? Do you need to pick away at it, you know, debreed it? What kind of debridement would you like to do? So I think how I imagine this is uh, building simulations that will hit all the key areas of wound care and allow the students to now apply the information. I think that will solve that learning problem. So that, that's what we're going to build for wound care. And we're building these cases, by the way, for neuro, cardiopalm, and peds. Um, if anybody has spare hours to, sh to, to, to share with me, uh, I could use them. But know that we are, this is not a pipe dream. We're, we're 50 simulations in. Uh, we're almost done with orthopedics and we're about to release that. Um, and then yesterday I said, team, I need to see, can we build a modalities sim? How could we help students learn about modalities when they don't have it in front of them? And this is how I think we can do it. And so... Um, just know that that's, that's, that's kind of my dream of working with faculty and supporting learning. And your support really helps us to continue to develop th these kind of things uh, almost as fast as you can imagine it. So, well, I think uh, with that in mind, thank you so much. I know we went a little over. Uh, where's quite... the recording, Mike? When somebody asked, where's the recording? Oh, of, we're... Of we are going to post this recording. I have to go through. I put timestamps in it so you don't have to watch the whole thing. So uh, it'll take me a day or two to process it. And then we're going to email the recording to all the faculty who have signed up to attend this, as well as if you go to YouTube and look up physioU.com or physioU on YouTube, you will see this webinar posted there. So this webinar will be uh, going back, going out to all of you probably in the next couple of days. So I just wanted to thank everybody for attending. Uh, hang in there. Please stay safe. And know that um, PhysioU uh, is here to support you and your students. I mean, you can tell that my first love has always been, for the last 17 years of my career, is teaching and, and, and helping the students become change makers. And so I hope to partner with you and your programs in this journey. So thank you so much. Uh, look forward to uh, being in touch with all of you again. Oh, and by the way, um, hang on one second. Uh, for those of you who actually have time to stay back and just chat, um, James and I are actually free for the next 20 minutes to actually just get some comments. Uh, you can unmute yourself. And um, for those of you who have to leave, thank you so much for attending. Um, yeah, we're just open for comments. and. Uh, comments and questions or even thoughts about what you guys are doing in your online labs. Cool. Anybody have some comments? Hey, Mike. Hi, James. Uh, thank you so much for releasing those access codes. Um, I was able to implement it in my uh, intro to PTA course, and it really helps uh, facilitate with their learning on Kines. Um, they were taking a face-to-face -face Kinesis course, which I don't teach. It's up to other instructors, but that has immediately turned to an online course. And right. So having to deal with a lot of the spatial learning um, just out of a textbook uh, with in their color, the, the pictures aren't even in color for their muscles. And so uh, hyperlinking it to show the videos of actually somebody palpating um, has really helped to give 
more of a three dimensional space of, of what they need to be doing um, in a lab based. And then just kind of talking them through uh, where the palpations are, you know, grab your leg, uh, leg, you know, take the lateral side of your behind your knee and find, you know, your biceps more extended and just kind of working all the way around the knee. But to have, you know, the pictures of the palpation, oh, they see it. And then I can kind of say, well, now right there, you can, you can, you can palpate. Uh, if you go a little bit more medially, you can find the corporate process or up above that, you find the clavicle and you can kind of direct those students. So it gives such a good visual on that. It's an awesome Absolutely. thing. I mean, uh, Sam, thanks for bringing that up. I think um, exactly what you're bringing up where, this, where things that you know in the first 30 seconds of you trying to get them to follow your thoughts and talk about landmarks, the moment you can put an image in front of them, changes the game in terms of their engagement and their ability to translate what you are saying into meaningful information. So yeah, I think that has been a really big, uh, really big thing for us as well is everything that you want to talk about in ortho, you can illustrate with an image. That's per why we purposely put reference images. Every single one of these t techniques and tests, we cut an image and make sure that you see all of these different tests, every single one of these I do by hand because part of the value of the app is not just watching all the videos, but actually having that trigger that gets them to remember something that they saw before or that they have just been taught, right? Think about how fast you can talk through a pattern of examination, treatment, and interventions uh, like modalities by using these images and linking these thoughts together. So yeah, thank you for, for bringing that up and we're glad glad it's Sam, useful. Sam, what program are you associated with? South Arkansas Community College. Okay. It's a PTA program. Yeah, yeah and Sam has done some amazing work as well, uh, integrating the PhysioU content into his uh, Articulate 360 courses and uh, pr some pretty amazing stuff. So Sam, you're right up there in terms of developing these really cool cutting edge things. So a question for Sam and, and Dave Pesner, maybe because it sounds like you guys have been using this app for and have some familiarity with it because of the time you've been using it. And you made a comment, Dave, though, that when you got a new faculty, it takes some time, but to kind of get and integrate it and recognize uh, all that's on there. It's almost this analogy to someone who like, and I'm going to date myself by saying this, but yeah, you used Hoppenfeld for your orthopedic special tests and now you're doing, and now you're using uh, McGee or something else. And I think it just takes time. For them to recognize the new textbook or the new app, you know, kind of a, a modality, and and um, you find resistance or reticence to them uh, doing that, or you just say, "Hey, do it," because you know, it's, if you want your job, that's what you do. Uh, if you want to go first, Dave, do you have a comment well, on no, that? I, I was just, I was just going to say that you know, I'm not force feeding my faculty to do anything. I'm just trying to guide them like I am the students. The problem is, is that for, for me to stay on top of what the content is and, and uh, you know, utilize the cheat sheet and, and embed apps and all that stuff is a task and a half. And, uh, and to kind of not have a really clear educational pathway f from, for the educational aspects of the faculty is uh, a stop. So uh, the students, the, the students, once they're once they're in it, then they'll explore to their heart's content. But faculty, especially on the fly. So Mike made a comment about you know looking at it in advance and planning things out, which obviously we always do. But there's going to be something that comes up in a question, or you you just go, oh man, I thought I had this conveyed in a way. Let me grab this image. Let me grab this video. And uh, we use we use a lot of this stuff. I we use. Uh, the Gray Institute's uh, 3D map stuff, and we use the Gray Institute's uh, certification applied functional science just because I want to get the mask, you know, at the videos. But it's practical stuff, and um, and they'll pick that up pretty fast. The instructor knowing where to get it, that's a, a little yeah. bit of a stop. <laughs> I think on our end, uh, with the PTA program, uh, we're a one plus one, so everything's so fast in program, and my hope was to get the kinesiology instructors, which aren't in program using physio U, but then it's a new uh, learning methodology. It's something different and outside of it. So what I decided to do um, was to really just implement what I 
would have liked them to do um, within kinesiology, putting that into my intro to PTA course, which is not within the program, it sits beforehand. And so that way, as they're learning in their own kinesis books with two different kinesiology professors, we're throwing out uh, physio U, those palpations in the intro course and just kind of reemphasizing that because it's, you know, there's there's the rote memory of kinesiology and palpation where things are, but then to really put it in a 3D uh, spatial understanding is, is much more. The, the students were coming from kinesa, okay, I can point at something to palpate it, but they aren't really getting how, okay, I can roll over this tendon or, or here's the whole circumference of, of this this bone of the corporate process or, you know, how the, the tendons interact. So um, really that was kind of a cut through to get more of it within program, starting it with their intro, they're getting it within their first year, and then they're used to seeing the palpation. And I'll kind of go from palpation to manual muscle testing because they'll get that later. Um, and, and so they're kind of getting used to see those pictures and they know kind of how to navigate that, um, the, the, the physio U website, they know where things are. So it's a little more intuitive by the time they get into the program. And I would just add in here that I think the simplest way and the fastest way to leverage the physio U content is really to augment your lab handouts. It's just like boom, boom, boom. Cause you know, it's a very finite task. I have a lab handout for Monday that I need to get ready. So I'm going to find whatever techniques I can and augment that lab handout because now the students will be like, whoa, that's new. That's really cool. And that's all of a sudden, you, even for you, all you have to do is bring up the lab handout and click on the link. You don't have to dig around for it in the app. It will take you directly to what you want to talk about. So that is the fastest way to leverage the vast library of techniques. The next level is... I'm now trying to solve a different problem, which is not just show techniques, because I know at the end of that, what you get is a bunch of students who only know how to do things when you call it out. Show me a Hawkins Kennedy test. I can do that, but I have no idea what it's for. The next level of complexity that all faculty have to consider is, how do I turn you into a clinician? And that is where actually the conversation is a little bit, it, this is the more nuanced part of the app where you can actually walk through different conditions. The CardioPoem app is like that. The, the orthopedic app is like that. You can walk through the different conditions, talk about the examination, the treatment strategies, the therapeutic exercises, and all of that becomes the foundation to creating a model for how students may eventually practice. And then the case studies whether they're created by yourself or you're leveraging the case studies we are building, those case studies allow the students now to begin to utilize their clinical reasoning process. So I think there are many stages that need to occur for a clinician to be hatched from our students. And utilizing this technology may have to be in phases. Right now, you just need to put out four fires. That is, I need to teach some techniques and I don't have great resources to do it. Well, PhysioU can solve that fire. And eventually you're going to be like, you know, I, I got that under control. Now I need to figure out how do I play this stuff out with them so that they can actually see how it all goes together. And that is, I mean, I carve out an hour of my face-to-face -face time with them to play the app through because I believe that that time invested creates the ability for the students to actually assimilate the, the, the information and the techniques I'm teaching them into a meaningful context. This is the next critical step before they head out into the clinic, is where what kind of patient does this apply to? What kind of dosage should I use for this intervention? If this patient gets worse, because all of our cases should have a patient getting worse or getting better, so that the students can make a decision, how do I progress this intervention? And that applies to the PT and PTA group. All of the orthopedic sims that we're building will have that component. At the end of every game, there will be like, patient came back week two. Here's what they told you. How would you like to progress or regress the intervention? So know that we are trying to help solve that problem. Um, and know that the, the different apps... Uh, 
the different apps can be utilized for different levels of, of learning on the hierarchy, right? Some of it is just, I just need to show them techniques and give them a tool that they can begin to mimic. I was also going to say that I do think there's some value. I've been reading some articles about using mental imagery. When I'm thinking about modalities, I want my students to say, I want, I'm in, in, in the questionnaire I'm building, I want the students to have me tell them, imagine the traction machine. Think about the different parts of the traction machine in your mind. Now imagine the face of the, the, the dashboard for the device and what the different buttons are for, which is exactly why you saw us build the sim that way, because we wanted to make sure that all of these key things, I'm just bringing us back to this sim, we purposely added key components to this sim because we wanted them to think about the dashboard, to be familiar with it, to be able to picture it in their mind, right? And also, key critical moments in your discussion with a student, I think, like in my sheet, I will say, think about the, the, the steps for setup. Now visualize in your mind the steps for the setup, right? So you see that, that's why we put this here, is because I'm trying to reinforce what they learned in your notes, and I'm going to ask them to use mental imagery to, vi to, to set the patient up. I think this is, we, we should probably be doing this even when class is normal, uh, whether it's face-to-face -face or not, but uh, I think students need to know how to do this, and there's some good evidence that it improves performance. It, it, it can help with your, your skill set. A lot of that, of, co of course, is in sports uh, from the articles I've been reading, but it's what I'm going to be implementing in my classroom because I think it's useful for them to imagine what the device looks like, imagine how the setup's going to be, to, to play air guitar, but instead of doing air guitar, they're actually going through the motions of setting some things up. I think that's okay. I mean, it's, it's what we have to do for this time frame. Any comments about that or something that you guys have already been doing uh, similar to that, related particularly to motor skill development. I just want to open it up to anybody else, uh, and Sam and Dave as well, any comments about this type of idea? No, I think you're exactly on the right track as far as our, our pain goes. If we have to list our pains as professors, as I was saying before, getting them to make that jump for our PTA student is particularly difficult. Um, getting PT students that we have come in to our program periodically because a CI will drag them with us um, and teaching them how to utilize their juniors is super important. But I was gonna say that one of the great things that happened just to back up my other comments and, and Sam touched on this is if we start the app the use of the app from day one in introduction to PT, we're an integrated program, so I get them sooner. Um, then that drives the engagement with the professor. Oh, did you know we have this already? And that's been able to make it possible for those who weren't maybe as technologically uh, savvy on the teaching side to go look at it and grab it and go, oh, this is great. And it's so, because it's so intuitive and easy to use. Yeah. I'll tell you that that is you you hit on something really critical, and that is the value of this. The cost of it is one textbook, right? So any one textbook you you eliminate, you've got the app for four years for the students. So that's one thing. The second thing is the fact that you can leverage this content from the first day of class is really powerful because it's the tool that keeps on they keep interacting with. I mean, think about stickiness. I mean, when we're building apps and we're building software, we always think about how do you get clicks? And, and more importantly, are the clicks meaningful? Or do they take the students from who they were at point A to becoming a clinician at point B? So I think exposure over and over again really unlocks a value. So the student who goes out into the clinic for the first time who, have, who really hasn't had a chance to spend do a lot of mock evals because we haven't been together, imagine all of these clinical case studies and conversations about how, how all these pieces are tied together, how much more prepared they will feel because you've had a chance to walk them through virtually 
many of the objective the the exam for for orthopedics and i will tell you for neuro rehab we have a bunch of patient videos in the neuro rehab app that's coming out uh, sarah craft myself um, uh, and a collaboration between medical university of south carolina that app has a bunch of patients in there patients with stroke patients with parkinson's um, you know pa patients with traumatic brain injury and those will be other resources that faculty can just bring up, talk about the exam that might be relevant, do a movement analysis, talk about interventions that might be relevant. These are probably the most critical conversations that we need to be having with our students as we prepare their minds and their confidence for coming out into the clinical environment. Any other comments? I just um, want to make one more comment about that. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Let yeah. me just make one more comment because sure. then I'll, I'll bounce. Um, I don't know if you see this as a market, but uh, to that end, I would draw a parallel to uh, Teach Like a Champion, that series. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, there, there was an effort to try to find the best practices for teaching mm -hmm. by guys that were running a... Um, a charter school system and to the more you put up content little bits of content of you using the app of your professors using the app and showing how it's how it's done how i create it how i linked it to my app even in little short videos i think that would be really powerful for us for trying to drive its use yeah uh, you know from the bottom up uh, no, uh, point well taken just, just I, a thought yeah Definitely. I, I see that as valuable as well. Yes, someone else had a comment. Yeah, um, Mike, this is Mandy Johnson. Oh, hi, Mandy. Hi, I'm at San Diego Mesa PTA yep. program. Um, I want to thank you for all, everything. This has been very helpful, and I'm definitely using this as a resource um, for our, like, embedded in lab worksheets. And I look forward to having access to that modality section, too. That's going to be great as well. Yes. Um, I was excited to hear that the jurisprudence section would potentially be coming soon. And you had mentioned that California was um, already been done. Is there any idea of when that's going to potentially be released? Yeah. So this morning before the webinar, uh, because these are all interactive learning courses, so we have to set up a, a LMS-like learning page that uh -huh. all the PhysioU students uh, can get can get access to. We will probably be beta testing it among a few a few close schools. So um, I would say that today, actually, after this call, the team and I are investigating what type of back end software we need to house this so we can actually bring it out to the students. It's already been t we've been using it with some of our students as they prepared for their uh, jurisprudence exam. Mm -hmm. I think actually it could be available within the span of a couple of weeks. Awesome. So for, for California, uh, you can imagine James has a big task ahead of him to finish all the other states. But actually, yeah. uh, once we have these built, you're just changing out little bits of information here and there. Probably the bulk of it is the same for each state. So yes, California will be uh, available soon. Um, just so you know, this, this group of courses is... Uh, will be available, of course, to all the Physio U schools, but it, it, it's going to be a separate thing. It's not just embedded because it's not really a part of the apps. But I mean, it's it's it, it will be easily a very powerful tool to to be an adjunct in your classroom. So we we haven't even figured out how we're going to release it yet. But certainly your school, Dave's school, all the California schools, uh, we're going to be deploying it for you guys to play with so that we can vet it and make sure that it it's working well. And then we'll deploy it nationwide. Um, we'll deploy it nationwide. I, I think it will really be the way that we train legal uh, le uh, students who are very clear about the way they should be practicing. So yeah, I think this is the that's future of that. It's an amazing opportunity. It's always a, a challenge to figure out how to best teach that content because it, it is so extremely important. But you know, it's it's always a challenge to get that in. So um, I'm happy to work with you guys and that's perfect. Try anything because we're we have a new instructor teaching that course this semester. <laughs> and we've got 
you know, a few weeks left here in that class, and I'm happy to play with anything that you want to play with because she's... Oh, fantastic. So. You know, I will I will reach out to you and get access for you to start playing with. Um, the, the cool thing about this also is for a lot of the hybrid programs. So if you have students coming in from every state, right, uh -huh. how are you going to teach a laws and regs class for that? Well, Physio U will allow your student to log in with their zip code that they live in, and their course will go to them. They will learn what they need to learn. That's the power of this for the future. So um, it's going to be really cool. I mean, I've played several of these out. Even I didn't know half the things I needed to know because there's just no context to understand why I'm reading all this legalese. Yeah. But if you make the clinical cases relevant to clinicians, wow, the legalese is very useful all of a sudden. So yeah. great. I will be in touch about yeah. that, Mandy. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You got it. Any other comments or questions? A uh, quick one. This is Adriana from Galveston. Hi, Adriana. Um, at UTMB. Just wondering when you expect your new app to come out. Which one? The one for neuro. Oh, cases. we have a call with the MUSC tech team and my tech team, I think, on the 7th. That app, we, we, instead of releasing it directly on our platform, we may end up collaborating with MUSC and allowing phys all the PhysioU schools to access it. And so just for those of you who are still around, to give you a glimpse of what that looks like, um, it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, Sarah has been a visionary in this. So evaluations of a real neuro patient from the patient interview so you can watch the patient doing the interview. You can watch. You can watch the gait observation with and without the brace. Amazing. Right. So you have all of these patient videos, and the way she set it up, which is I think really so just cool. Just however you normally walk. Is also she's built interactive quizzes, so the students as they're watching the videos asynchronously can be going through a quiz and kind of learning about what kind of things I want you to look at. So I think that's kind of cool in the way it's guided. And from there, when you're done with the entire e exam, we're working together with her to try to get the intervention side of the exam so the student can watch it all the way through. Myself and our neuro instructor at APU, uh, Mary Hudson McKinney, have planned out to film five key neuro patients from beginning to end. Subjective, objective, movement analysis, and intervention, and then post-intervention movement analysis. So that students, so that instructors could actually stop the exam at any point of time and allow students to say, what would I, what do I see? What would I like to investigate? How would I like to intervene? And then watch the intervention being done and then looking at how the movement has changed. So you can see we're thinking big and we're think and of course all of this takes time and and money to film, but it's coming because there's no other way to train that, I think. There's just no other way. Um, here with her stuff here, you can see a lot of her interventions are all filmed. Okay, so there's going to be a library of common interventions, and there's also going to be a group of case studies that you will then, what she, she sent me the other day was, here's the interview, here's the 10 meter walk, and by the way, I have a bunch of case studies that go with these videos that will have the right questions and the right answers that faculty can now use to facilitate discussion. So. All of this is coming, and any faculty who has, for example, uh, in our PEDS app, yesterday I was talking with a PEDS instructor. I said, I would like to add in some videos so that the instructors can do standardized testing cases. So here is a seven-month baby, and you're going to do the aims with a, with a baby. And here's another one where you're going to do bilateral, you know, bot two. Uh, bilateral coordination, I think, is with bot too. Uh, here's the baby. So we are actually getting that ready to release because we know that this type of kind of inter interaction between the software and the student's clinical reasoning is so critical. So if you have videos that are consented, that you want to be able to contribute to this tool, the whole world can benefit. 
And so I want to open that up to any faculty who, who has this type of stuff. Uh, PhysioU is invested in bringing that to the masses. So um, and, and where yeah. should I, because I have a few, I can probably contribute. Where should I email it to? Oh, Mike at PhysioU.com. I think you, we can just jump on a call and kind of dream about where that should go and what you would want to show underneath it or what kind of text we should have underneath it. But yeah, please reach out and we can chat uh, anytime. Okay, thanks. Fantastic. Any other comments or questions? Well, I want to thank everybody uh, for being a part of this and uh, for being flexible and courageous for your students. So I hope that this will come in handy for you. Please don't forget, if you want to get access for your students, to make sure you go to the coronavirus link, physiou.com coronavirus. You apply here for your students. And if you have other faculty you want to get unlocked, you send a separate email because we give a different type of access to faculty. It's the same app, but it's a different type of access because the faculty access is limitless. The student access, as you know, we, we need the subscription to continue to build, to pay patients, to pay programmers. So um, if you uh, are able to, make sure you fill this out and... Um, Thank you for being a part of this meeting. It's, it's really an honor and a privilege to be in conversation with you um, and to be collaborating with you. So have a good, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, hope you all stay safe. Take care. Thank you, Mark. Take, take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, thank take you care. so much. Be well. Oh, yes, thank you, you too. Mark. Hey, you're welcome, guys. Thank you, everybody. All right, well, bye. Bye-bye. You have saved a lot of people a lot of headaches during this process. You think so? <laughs> yeah. I yeah, hope I, so. I would say the same thing, though. No, it, I it's... I say the same thing, and thank you. We use it in our program a lot. What I can't find is the links that you showed on your screen. Oh, I'll show it to you right now. Site, and I can't find those links. Yeah, so let me show you. No, no, no problem at all. So if you go to physiou.com under educator, under free resources, right here. Well, I'm here. actually logged in right now. As oh, an educator. oh, I know, but that's because you are not you are in the apps, whereas you need to go to our homepage. Got it. So yeah, one of our faculty good. emailed me this morning again and said, "Hey, I can't find it. It's because once you're logged into the apps, you end up here, right? You end up in here. But yes, sir. If you go to physiou.com and then go to educator free resources, the uh, the master cheat sheet is here, and so you guys Sorry, can start. Sorry, I'm really legit today. Yeah, no, no, not at all. I mean. Uh, it's it's not that easy to find. We'll we'll be thinking of ways to make it easier. So yeah, all of that oh, is yeah. here. Thank you much. Oh, you're welcome, Brandy. Mark, I must step right, out. Take to care, the... and everybody be well. My prayers are with everybody. Right, yeah. same here. Yeah, are you okay. stepping out, James? Yeah, because Dave Pesner wants to have a uh, conversation. Yeah, go for he it. Some, he has some laws and regs questions with the PT board. Yeah, fantastic. So you. So it's a free consult. <laughs> go for it. I think I'll just hang on here and just chat with uh, Sam for a few yeah. minutes. And Sam, what a pain in the tail. I mean, you got that, you know, I think uh, people are trying to get the curriculums less in PT programs by moving stuff out of program, like neuroanatomy or anatomy being taken as an, as an undergrad or graduate before you in the program, but you have no control. I mean, you have no, you, you know the strength and the depth and breadth of the kines class they get. And now you guys got to assume things. And that just makes it harder for the professional programs when you're moving those basic science courses out of the programs and maybe make your program shorter you know, and not less costly, but boy, and that's why I think SAP can help you because it gives a standard. And then at least in your, in your university, your college, you say, Hey guys, here's what, if, how many of your kines majors are, are pre PT or pre PTA. I mean, use this cause this is what we're going to, and they'll have it and it'll be you know, good for them. So good luck to you. That one plus one, boy, I heard that one. Ah, uh, <laughs> no, just, it makes your life hard. I know. So good luck yeah. to you. And uh, thank you, James. All right. I'm going to step off. All right. right. Thanks James. Sam, so, so you guys are also in the same boat, and man, all that work you've been doing to put things online early, <laughs> try to do that in two weeks. Well, that's if, by doing this project that I did this fall semester, I mean, it, it saved me so much. So all my, my helper else that I had putting together what we did with Articulate, um, our BPAA said, hey, can we bring those back and start helping other faculty? So 
everything that I kind of, you know, learned by talking to you on Physio U and then going to Dev Learn with you, I've been walking uh, process technology oh, nice. professors how to do Zoom meetings and Blackboard Collaborate meetings so they can go into their lab with their smartphone and film things and how to, like you say, give that pause for the student to be able to think, to be able to come up with it, to start imagining um, how, to, how to frame things out. Uh, one, one of those was third person um, viewing versus like you talked about uh, from a first person viewer looking yeah. at those things. Um, so it, you know, that's, that's where I, I really like to commend you for all your hard work because it's, it's not just helped my program, just working with you on this. It's helped other programs within our college. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Well, you know, this first person view thing, I've been thinking about it a lot. I brought it up to Marshall the other day. I said, Marsh, what do you think if we refilmed all 3,000 videos for Ortho with a camera on your forehead? <laughs> he just nearly passed out. I'm like, Marsh, I mean, this is the future of learning, motor learning. That's got to be one of the views. I mean, mm -hmm. I want to see what a therapist sees when they're setting up a mobilization, you know, or when they're applying a modality. Um, so I think there's a lot that needs to still be done. Um it's sleepless nights for me, but man, I'm telling you, I am in, I am just having so much fun creating. There's just not enough hours in the day. Um, but I think, I think you really having kind of thought this through kind of future proofed yourself a little when you started is a big deal, right? Cause when the crisis hits, you're not yeah. learning the software, you're building on what you've already built. And I think every, all of us are in a different phase of that. But if we can provide at least all the video resources initially, that allows you some the instructor some bandwidth to now do some other stuff. I mean, imagine trying to juggle both. Like, where am I going to film? How am I going to edit? And then how am I going to put it somewhere meaningful? Well, at least now the faculty can just think about how, how can I leverage what, what's already here? And then now I can spend some energy thinking about uh, you know, different, uh, interactive learning modules, like what you have, you know? Yeah. And I, I really like how you have, uh, put in together, um, you know, here's a hyperlink for the video, do it for your lab. So, you know, you don't have to build something fancy with articulate or, right. you know, upload in your LMS. You, you can put it, you can print it out on a piece of paper, hand it to the student or just upload it a PDF. Uh, in a Word document Word and doc. they are automatically hyperlinked. So that, that saves a lot of time putting things together. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, maybe when things calm down a little, uh, you, myself, Dave, I mean, any of the PTA instructors can get back on a call. We could do a group call just for PTA instructors and to talk about how to, um, you know, one of the things one of the PTA instructors had talked about is it would be nice to be able to help the PTA students get a sense of when is a good time to engage in a conversation with a PT about something not going right. Mm -hmm. Or even some of the soft skills stuff about how do I play out my role as the PTA as part of the team in navigating complex situations, whether that is related to red flags or yellow flags, psychosocial issues, these are all, I think, case-based things that we might want to consider. And the, mm -hmm. the PTA sim simulations, uh, we might want to create from the PTA faculty group, um, like these key moments that you know the students are going to end up facing in the clinic that we can pre-simulate for them and give them strategies on how to manage them, whether that's red flag identification and, you know, referring out to the MD or patients swelling got worse because of what the therapist did. And now I'm not sure what to do because the care plan of care says grade four mobs for the next eight minutes, you know? So I think all of those really could be conversations that uh, a, a small group of faculty have you set up the stage for the scenarios that I need to build and then our team builds them and then the PTA faculty validate them and then we release it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So keep that, in, keep that in mind and for any of the PT or PTA faculty who are, who are still listening in, if you think about things that really the simulations could help to solve, please shoot me an email or get in touch with me because... The team is churning away, building this stuff. 
and the voice of the faculty will help to streamline that process so that you get more of what you need instead of me just thinking about what you need. I mean, we're probably pretty close, but uh, I'm always open, as you know, to the to the faculty voice. So I hope you. Hey, I love the I love the house. That's your new office, huh? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> pretty slick. Uh, yeah, I wish I could turn my computer around, but it's uh, I've got a, a, a I looked at it circles and slashes drawings kind of similar to uh, my mother in law did kind of oh really one behind you so <laughs> that's awesome. Hey, well take care. I got to run. Thank you everybody, and we'll stay in touch, Sam. All right, thanks, Mike. Okay, Have take care. One. Take care, everybody. Yeah.